Well, hi, everybody, and thanks for having me. I'm always, it's always a privilege to talk to groups of data modelers and like-minded people and people struggling with the same types of problems around the world. And um, uh, this is a presentation that I gave the first time almost three years ago at the Data Vault conference in Vermont. And we dusted it off. Uh, and um, there seems to still be quite a bit of interest in the Micron Data Vault implementation, even though this is, um, oh, seven, five, six, seven years ago that we built this solution. I think the lessons that learned are still applicable today. So um, with that, we'll move move on through the slides. Um, so I'm Mike Magelski. I'm a founder and principal architect at Infovia, where we deliver solutions to our clients following many of the practices that you'll see in today's slides. We live in Boise, Idaho, and take a lot of time, as much time as possible, in the mountains and the rivers that are offered here. This is me right here on the, in the front left of that raft. That's on the Locksaw River. And we um, feel like uh, adventure is in our DNA, and that's why we like data and analytics. And it, it's kind of like climbing a mountain. To me, data is like climbing a mountain where you think you're at the top, and then you find out, well, no, there's a lot more of the mountain beyond what you just climbed. And if you've ever done that and been there at that feeling, you think you've arrived, but you haven't yet. There's always something more to discover in data, and we really feel like that is what we help our clients achieve is that never ending cycle of learning that we take through uh, the organizations that we partner with. Our company history we founded in 2018 when uh, I left Micron at that time and we've had clients around here in the Pacific Northwest in the US as well as some international clients on a various uh, a degree of industries. Uh, what we found is that these, these um, principles are ubiquitous. They tend to apply in all industries, not just high tech or high volume. Um, some of the data that we've worked with is highly classified. Other data is highly complicated. And in all those cases, these these solutions that we um, tend to, to live by or these philosophies seem to be uh, applicable. Our vision is to share data management best practices with organizations that hope to grow through better insights into their data. And we do specialize in uh, data warehouse automation and data vault implementations, although we've done other implementations as well. Our agenda today is really to talk about those philosophies themselves, the power of being able to collaborate with other teams and simplify your solutions and drive solutions through metadata and build patterns and classify your data and secure it and innovate, right? All these things are interrelated with each other. And I've tried to break this down into a some, uh, we need some mute out there. I think we've got some people unmuted. Um, there's been, there's been a lot of times when uh, no subset of these is, appro is appropriate. In other words, you can't remove one of these elements from a, a project uh, and expect it to be successful. I think they, they uh, drive each other and help to build a better solution. Some of them are very motherhood and apple pie, right? Like trust, right? But others are very technical, like, you know, you know how do we go about innovation? Uh, or, you know, are we metadata driven, for example? So there's a very, a varying degree of philosophies here. We're going to talk about the Micron data warehouse. This is where everyone, this, this is what seems to gather the attention. Uh, it was complex in that it was large, and that's what gives it its notoriety. It's actually not the largest data vault in the world. That, I think, belongs somewhere in uh, U.S. Uh, security or data data. Um, uh, De Department of Defense, but it's the largest one that can be talked about. So it gets the, I guess that's, we get the spotlight all to ourselves maybe. Uh, but Micron is, is, has been around for over 40 years now. Like I said, these slides were presented in 2018. So this is 2017 data. And um, uh, Micron now produces a third of the world's memory. So every bit that is pr consumed in your mobile devices or automobiles or laptops or or um, data centers, a third of that is coming from Micron um, as far as the memory is concerned, flash and DRAM memory. Uh, 34,000 team members, I think we had 50,000 users of our data warehouse. 
Um, I, I should say we had 50,000 logins. I, they didn't all use it, I'm exaggerating, but there were 50,000 people that we had to consider as users, especially when it came to securing our data. Um, the business problem at Micron was building these things down here in the bottom right, these chips, out of these things in the upper left, these wafers. That's a semiconductor wafer, a silicon wafer that's bombarded with electrons and technology. To make a wafer like that, then it's cut into um, rectangles and in, in, embedded in this packaging material with leads here. This is the front and back side of a chip. If you've never seen one, um, that's what's in it. The, the wafer is what's in it, at least a little tiny sliver of that wafer. They can get thousands of parts, thousands of DRAM chips out of one wafer, thousands of flash memory chips out of one wafer. And um, our problem was always how to make them faster, how to get more good ones out of a wafer, right? When you slice these up, how many of them actually function and perform with the speed and quality that we expect? And then how to constantly improve that process. And we believed, um, at least we were funded by people that believed that the solution to better manufacturing in the high volume semiconductor space was analytics. And I think that applies to many businesses now. Um, we, we, may have, we may have led some of the charges in this regard, but um, I, what we've found is that our clients of all sizes and shapes benefit from analytics. There's always a, an opportunity to lower your expenses or increase your revenue and somehow positively affect your bottom line through analytics. Micron um, had challenges on this journey, right? So we started the journey with a, a pile of cash and a team of about uh, 15 to 20 people and a, an idea that we were going to build a global data warehouse, but we had a lot of challenges in that process. And one of them was that we had 15 sites around the world and they didn't all do business the same way. I'm sure you, a lot of you can relate to that, right? If you're a distributed workforce, then um, the systems are different. A lot of these came through acquisition. We did our best to to manage the uh, Micron did its best to uh, to manage the source systems and and, and keep those that footprint low. But uh, in an architecture perspective, the best laid plans. There's always gaps in those, and the analytic team ends up dealing with those gaps one way or another. Right. Ultimately, when people need to see insight and data, they don't care that that data happens to come through two different systems or four different, or in this case, 15 different manufacturing systems. So we had all the, the typical problems you have um, in that, in that our, our data was distributed and that there were spot solutions and that there were cowboys running their own, you know, individual Excel sheets and Tableau, you know, models and all that going on. But we had to build something that was going to be a foundation for the company. And um, our processes were comp constantly changing, were always complex, and we were adding more sensors every day, more, more machine-generated data. And so let's talk about that, more data. Um, most organizations never see a billion rows in their data warehouse. Sorry, Kent, it's just most organizations stay pretty small in terms of their data sets because a lot of data is hand-generated. And I'm not saying that's less complex. I'm just saying it has less volume. We actually had very clean data because it was all machine generated. So that was, that was one of the advantages we had is that most of it aligned pretty well. And it was pretty clean. It was pretty uh, uh, well uh, structured, right? You don't get that if, if, if your data is being entered by a, you know, an order specialist or a, a receptionist at a desk. You get dirty data and you might only have thousands of rows, but it might be extremely difficult to deal with those thousands. So we're not bragging here. This is just the reality. We were dealing with a lot of data. That's the problem we had to solve. We had billions of rows. Okay, you might say, well, that's not, I've got, some of you might say, well, I have more data than that. So think about our business process, right? Selling to customers. We didn't have that many customers. We sold to, oh, we were an original equipment manufacturer. We sold to a few customers around the world that used our products in there. In, in, in building their PCs and data centers and and uh, mobile devices and automobiles, right? So we had, th that data doesn't even blip. The RSAP ERP data doesn't even blip on this map, but I'm not saying it wasn't important and it was valuable. It just wasn't large. 
our tracking data, which is those wafers, counting those wafers and keeping track of them as they move through the process. There was millions, tens of millions of rows of that data, maybe even 50 million, but it wasn't billions, okay? Then we start testing the product that we're producing, all right? We start actually looking at the bits and making sure they're functioning the right way. Now you're starting to get into some big data. That's called probe. Fab4 was our R&D facility, so it had low volume of throughput, but it had a lot of but, but, but the data was very important to it. So now we're getting up into the hundreds of billions of rows, right? And then when we start actually testing the production data, the actual bits in production, we're getting up to thousands of billions of rows. So now, okay, so we're at a trillion records. Congratulations, you hit two trillion, something most organizations never meet. But we were only touching the tip of the iceberg. And we were getting some of our data sets where we were sampling a significant number of the bits of some of the new product, for example, that was coming off of our production lines. And these data, this data was was uh, in tens of billions of records per day. We had a process that was running every five minutes and loading a billion records every five minutes. So it, you can see it's it's growing quickly and and really it's never ending. So we had a big problem to solve. And we had a lot, remember I said we had five different sites? Well, we had, we had to figure out how to get all that data into one location, first of all, right? How do we just pipe it in? How we build these things? We've got billions of records a day flowing in. How do we make this work? What are we going to do to just get it ingested, let alone modeled? Just copying it from the source systems was a challenge all of itself, all of its own. And so we came up with a set of nine criteria that this was our criteria that we needed our data warehouse, our new global data warehouse, our modern data warehouse, we needed it to do these things for the company. And some of these are pretty common, right? Everybody wants their data integrated, of course, right? Agile, do you just mean we use the agile processes? No, what we meant is that we needed it to change because we knew that by the time we got it built, we would already have new demands and new, new iterations, right? We needed a a tool and a platform and a data model that all allowed us to add on incrementally piece by piece and grow without significant re-engineering okay so that that centerpiece that agile that probably drove our thinking as much as anything else was how can we build something that we can build onto and change and it's it's change able right we need it to be supportable we need ultimately at the end for somebody to be able to manage this crazy thing that we're building um, and documentation helped with that but a lot of people don't think about this when they build their data warehouse they think oh we got to you know they maybe they maybe start up here at the upper right and maybe they end it centralized <laughs> or maybe they get to integrate it a little bit but most organizations never get past two or three of these and we needed nine and we needed them to all work well and we had ip that not only protected the recipe, we literally call them recipes, our secret recipes to build these chips. Not only did we need to protect that IP, but we needed to make sure that we complied with all the government regulations. And we even had, we made, we made parts for the DOD, the Department of Defense. So some of those parts were restricted. If those uh, secrets got out to say some country in say Asia, that might not be friendly with us, people would go to jail. So we had to be secure. That was, we had to design security into the solution. It couldn't be pasted on on top, okay? Couldn't be frosted with it later. Had to be baked into the cake. So these philosophies emerged from this need to build this data warehouse. I'm gonna pause for a second. Uh, any, if there's any questions, you can either post them. If they can wait, just post them. If you want, if you have anything right now, uh, so far, let me know. I'll pause here for, seconds okay so our philosophies start to emerge and and that's where these these uh these elements start to come out of our um, um out of our philosophies right now the power of sharing why is that the first one i talked to well because we knew we couldn't do this alone we knew that we had to leverage the work of other people we had to stand on the shoulders of those who came before us we look at people like Bill Inman and Dan Linstead, right? The, the folks that have, have pioneered um, Ralph Kimball to some extent. We used uh, star schemas for some of our some of our um, data marts or info marts, right? So we had to stand on the on the shoulders of these people. 
we had to uh, collaborate. So we had to get involved with the community. And eventually you'll see that we chose Data Vault as a modeling paradigm. We had to talk with other people doing Data Vault. And we found some over in uh, Kaiser Permanente, a fairly large healthcare organization just west of us here in the United States. We partnered with them. We had some discussions with them as well as Blue Cross of Idaho and Boeing. And then some of the, our technology partners like Teradata and Wearscape, they helped us get here. And that's really why we're here today talking with you is because we still believe in this culture of sharing what we know and starting a dialogue with other people who've already solved the problems that we're solving today, right? We're all, very few problems are new to anyone. You just have to find the right people that have solved them before because as Eleanor Roosevelt said, you can't live long enough to make all the mistakes yourself. And this is true too. The most elegant solution or an elegant solution, it doesn't need to be the most elegant, but an elegant solution isn't always obvious. It takes collaboration among teams that are coming from different perspectives in order to get there. We also knew that we needed to build this iteratively. This is what I'm talking about, the agile approach, right? So, so we talked about, let's, let's solve problems one at a time, but with a big picture in mind. And then let's deliver solutions often, let's adjust and iterate. Problem with that is, it's inefficient, right? You end up redoing things a lot. And so we knew that we needed to drive our high volume pipelines as well as our iterative approach with metadata because the two perspectives were get it done fast and get it done right, right? And the only way you can do it fast and right and be change able is if you can automate as much as, as possible of that. Now we were an automation company. We built our chips through automation, so we have that advantage going for us. We already thought the culture of Micron was if you wanted to do it, if it was worth doing twice, it was worth automating, right? So we knew that we had to automate our data solution just like we did for our, um, for our product that we were building, right? Our, our DRAM product that was going out the door was automated. We automated that as much as possible. Let's apply the same approach to our warehouse. And from that, we get better quality. That's kind of a given. It's practically free because you generate code instead of writing code. You generate DDL, you generate test scripts, okay? Um, and then we got other things uh, out of it as well And that when we changed our minds, we could regenerate. That's the fork in the road, right? When we came to a fork in the road, we took it because we embraced change because we could apply our metadata to a slightly adjusted template and regenerate uh, the subset of our warehouse. And we knew the quality was going to be high too because it was generated, not human driven. We were taking out the factors that cause defects, which is just a process we used in manufacturing. Okay. I still say we, although I've been gone from Micron for three years. Um, so I apologize for that. I'll start saying they, because it's, it's really their solution now. I, I don't have a hand in this anymore, but um, so I'll start saying they. The documentation, was a, a, another benefit. And then we um, found even more benefits from it. I'll get to those later. Um, hint, we aren't on Teradata anymore. The user's perspective, okay. I've come to a user, I came out of a software development background. So I've come to a user with a, a requirements document and asked them to give me their requirements. It, it just doesn't work. Right? They just look at you with a blank stare. They give you a few sentences and then they're ready to get on back to their work, right? I've even come to users with a, a, a data model and a few of them will engage at that process, but mostly you lose people with a data model. I think Data Vault is really good at helping users understand the data model because I think it simplifies. At least the spine model is very easily understandable. I've had great discussions around a Data Vault data model with business users, but Still, you can't come with a model and say, does this manage your business? Is this what you want your analytic solution to do? You really need your data visualized and the users to interact with that data. And that's that part of climbing the mountain where you get there and you think you've arrived, but then you realize you just uncovered a whole new iceberg and you've only seen the tip of it, right? You've got 10,000 more feet to climb for those who live here in the Rocky Mountains. So that's the approach we suggest taking at building a data warehouse. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And if it's worth doing right, it's worth automating. 
And so let's talk a little bit about the math behind this, because if we can generate our model from our metadata, if we can aspire to that, then certainly we could generate a data warehouse, warehouse objects. A lot of modeling tools do that, right? And if we can take that to the next step, if we've collected the appropriate metadata at the right level, we can also generate our load logic for that, right? If we have the mappings to the source systems at the column level and any transformations in our metadata, then we can automate the load logic as well. And then the last step that we took is let's automate the views. Let's automate the way the users are looking at the data. Let's try to generate those views as well. OK. And what does that buy us? Well, it buys us the fact that now we can build iterations quickly by making small adjustments, regenerating our code, rebuilding our warehouse, reloading it and creating a new solution. Now, I don't say you reload the whole data warehouse, but it gives you that opportunity we did multiple times re rebuild our whole data warehouse because we made mistakes early and then we corrected them and built it again and then eventually we were built rebuilding small pieces of it but the point is that if you get your model right 60 percent of the time and you put it in front of a user they're going to give you feedback on that right now you've got something they can give you feedback on they say ah you're 60 percent right but you're 40 percent wrong well, now, if in your next iteration, you correct just 60% of the errors that you had wrong the first time, that's another 24%. So now you're at 84%. And if you do that again, you're connecting another 10% of your errors. So now you're at 94% right with just three iterations. And you did this with code generation. You didn't have to write a lick of code, except maybe a small snippet in a transformation somewhere, right? But you captured it all in metadata. So if you have to adjust it, you just build it again. And you iterate. If you happen to get it 70 or 80 percent right the first time, you're at 99, 97 to 99 percent right in three iterations. What the point here is what you don't what, what you're not doing is trying to get everything perfect, build it once, deploy it to your users and walk away. Right. We all know that's ridiculous. Those projects always fail. This is a better way. We chose Wearscape for automation. They were kind of the only player at that time. They're now just the, they're now one of many, but they're the most mature and they're the best enterprise solution. So we recommend them to all of our clients. I'll just be flat out biased at that. We're biased towards Wearscape because it's been around the longest and it does its job really, really stinking well. It, we have built data warehouses in 90 days that, um, that are supportable and usable for clients. So, we know it works, so that's why we use it. So that's my little plug for Wearscape. We're also a Wearscape partner. So, um, but we've, we've become a believer just because it does this job and it does help us achieve fast documented and supportable warehouse solutions. Fast and not only is it fast to generate code, but the code is better, it is bug free. We generated one data warehouse for a Fortune 100 company that had $32 billion in revenue. And on our first iteration, we tied out to within 1.02 pennies. I take that back. It was our second. We had to correct one problem in our metadata, rebuild the, gen the warehouse, regenerate the data, and their financial data tied out to within 1.2 pennies across $32 billion of annual transactions. So that's proof that it works. Right. We're taking the human element, the error, the things that cause errors, we're taking them out of the process through code generation. I'll pause here. Any questions? Challenges? This was the benefit that we didn't hadn't counted on. I told you we're not on Teradata anymore. They I should I'll say they Micron is not on Teradata anymore. They asked us to help them move to the cloud. Um, we bought Snowflake that actually Kent's on the call. He and I had the first discussion about Snowflake at Micron. Probably what Kent, maybe I'm going to say 2016. It might have been 2015. Anyway, well, we had the, we, um, yeah, we had the first discussion about it at the uh, WWDVC you exactly. in Maine. Yep. And our answer was. Nope, we'll never go there because it's not secure. <laughs> exactly. And that was what we and it was after this. Was our, it was after this presentation. That was our official sea level, you know, position at that point in time in 2016. And in 2019, we moved Mike around to the cloud. So that's how fast things can change in three years, right? Now, there were some smart people, and some might even be on this call, 
to help make that happen. I, I, I didn't uh, help make the political side of that happen. But obviously, Snowflake got really good at what they do. Micron got really comfortable um, looking around because they were having problems on their current platform. And so there were other things that drove that solution. But my point here is that because we were metadata-driven code generation automation shop, when we moved to a new platform, we just regenerated the objects with Snowflake templates, lifted and shifted the data with Snowflake templates in Wearscape, and ran the processes in Wearscape that loaded them, and voila, 99 days from the day Micron signed the Snowflake contract to the day they shut off their Teradata instance. Think about that. The world's largest data vault moved platforms in 99 days from signing to finishing. And tell them, and how much data was that, Mike? It was hundreds of terabytes. It wasn't a petabyte because we didn't have a petabyte in our relational systems. Some of that really big data was um, actually, uh, we used um, federation solutions to drill out into our Hadoop environment for some of those uber large satellites. Essentially, the measurement data was out in satellites, out in our ter uh, Hadoop. So we moved hundreds of terabytes. You might know exactly, but it was, yeah, somewhere in there. The point is there was, there was you know, a, a couple hundred objects, database objects, and some of them had a few, a trillion records in them, right? A couple of them had a trillion records. And that all moved with no interruption to the business. We dual pipeline moved to both, you know, we were loading both systems while we were backloading the one. And so in one day they just turned off the Teradata instance and they're running on Snowflake now. But we did that because we had built this platform based on metadata driven code generation. And we hadn't even intended that benefit. Like Kent said, when we selected Wearscape as a tool, there's no way we were gonna move platforms. And three years later we did. <laughs> All right, a little bit about our journey towards selecting data vaults. We knew that we had to, we knew we had so much data and so many different flavors that we were going to have to find patterns in that day. We couldn't write an ETL job for every pipeline. We couldn't write an ETL job for every stage or transformation. We needed to find patterns in our data. So we went out looking for that, right? And we knew that our data had some classifications. This is before I had ever even heard the word data vault. I just, we just knew that we had definition data, we had event data, and we have descriptive data, right? And there was kind of maybe a few other kinds, but 98% of our data fell in one of these categories, right? Our really big data was descriptive. It described the results of a test against our product. Well, product is a definition data, um, as is any one part that we manufactured, right? As is a person or a place or a thing. And then the events are where those kind of relate to each other, right? We we hadn't gotten, we hadn't realized yet that that you can actually create a, an entity that's just a relationship. And that relationship might be an event, but it might just be a relationship between two other entities or seven other entities or 67 other entities, right? But this is where we, this is how we went about that journey is we, we knew that we had to find patterns because it was too big for us to do even with a team of 15 or 20, we had to align on ways of doing our work. And so we first looked at the classification of our data. Let's classify it into what makes up our data, okay? Notice that one little item down here is temporal. We knew our data was constantly changing. It was changing over time. Sometimes it changed because people made mistakes. They recorded the wrong result of a test, which could, if you can imagine, like in a healthcare scenario, a wrong test result could mean a wrong diagnosis or a wrong treatment, right? Well, kind of the same thing applied to micro. And we knew that data was always changing. We needed to differentiate between things that should change and things that shouldn't. And those that things that do change, we needed to capture that change. So I started kind of preaching this idea, and that was the temporal pyramid. And I'd teach. We hired a lot of new. Uh, you know, new data engineers right out of college. And they, at first they didn't, I, I don't think anybody, there's an aha moment in someone's career when they start to understand temporal data, right? So I'd, I'd use this to explain to them. At the base, if you capture what happened, the change data capture, right? For those of you who use a, have, are fortunate enough to have a CDC tool that does change data capture, you know everything that happened to that data 
which is probably a good representation of what happened in real life, right? If you capture that, then you can build a what was query over that that tells you what the data was at any given point in time. You can build a picture of history. And from that, the most recent element is the what is. So you can build the current snapshot. But it all comes down to basing it on the what happened, the temporal change aspect of our data. Okay, so we knew we needed to, to capture that, but that wasn't the goal. Anybody can do this stuff. Heck, now you can create a temporal table and it does this. Ultimately, the goal was to predict the future. Use that past data in AI and machine learning models to predict what's coming, right? So if you can think in a semiconductor scenario, it takes teams of people, dozens of weeks, thousands of variables to manufacture one part type, one product. And they don't get it right the first time. So they have to go through that process again, send it off and have the dyes that make the, the product, the, the, their photolithography masks they're called, they take weeks to manufacture just the mask. And every time you change one, one variable in your manufacturing process, you have to rebuild one of those masks. I shouldn't say every time. There's other variables you can change too, but some of these take weeks to change and weeks to test. And then you have to run product through dozens or hundreds of steps in order to get the results. What if we could model that and predict what the result of changing that variable is going to be? Now we can reduce our cycles of learning, our cycle time. We can build product faster. We can beat our competition to the market on the new product. We can shrink our product faster and get more per wafer so that we have higher profit margins. We can build better quality so that our users get faster parts that function for long periods of time, even in high heat applications like under the hood of your automobile. Okay, so these were the challenges and we were solving them with data, but it was based on this idea that we had to predict the future. So, enter Data Vault. I first heard about this. A colleague said, hey, I heard about this thing. It's weird. It sounds like you're locking up your data, but it's actually not that at all. You're actually vaulting it into a new, I, I came up with this myself. It's more like you're vaulting it into a new dimension, right? It's more like the, the vault Olympic sport, right? I like to think of it that way because really what Data Vault does is it, first of all, it encompasses patterns because it reduces the complexity of your data down to basically three different types of objects, hubs, satellites, and links. There's a few others for special purposes, but basically it's that, right? It simplifies, so it's easy to automate. It's easy to build a template to build a hub. It's auditable. It captures all the history all the time if you build it right. That's the trick. So we embraced Data Vault. We went to the Data Vault conference. That's where some of us on this call met. That's where I met Dan Linstead. Dan came out to Boise. We brought him out here several times, at least twice. Um, we talked till late in the night, uh, you know, in hotel lobbies and things. And we came up with solutions that would work for Micron. And it changed the Data Vault um, uh, to some extent, right? Things like multi-active satellites, while they always existed, this became a real um this became a real need for them because we had data that was changing so fast that we couldn't remodel our satellites every day so we had to capture some of that data in in uh, in other forms and so i said all that to say um we we leveraged people in the business that were uh that had been down this path and then we stretched and we pushed and we brought our technology partners we bring the cto of wearscape and the inventor of Data Vault and the architect of Micron's data, and we'd sit together in a room and we'd collaborate. And we found that Data Vault was the approach that we were going to take. And so you remember, these were our nine options or nine things that we were trying to accomplish, and we were kicking these off, you know, one at a time. We had a, we had our our centralized warehouse, and it was agile, and we Data Vault helped us to integrate it in a in an iterative fashion and we were building pretty fast and, but we still had we weren't done yet we had to innovate there were some problems that people had solved before and um 
this is where I have to hats off to one of my former bosses. He told us one day, he said, we just dropped, I won't say what the figure was, but it was, it was in, a, in the eight figures on our technology and we don't know how to use it. Let's have a competition. And he pulled our team together and he said, we just bought uh, some tools and uh, Wearscape, we just purchased Wearscape at this point. He says, I want you guys to take this brand new Teradata box that we just stood up and nobody's using it and it's Greenfield. And I want somebody to crash that thing. And I want you to use Wearscape to do it. And I'm dividing you into two teams and the team that does, I'm giving you dinner and movie tickets. And we went out with reckless abandon and built stuff just to try to make it work and load data, as much data as we could, as fast as we could into as many tables as we could using the technology that we had bought. And we certainly crashed the Teradata box and we certainly learned a lot and we iterated and we did that 60, 84, 94 uh, iteration over and over again on different sets of data and on different concepts, but we got better every time. And this was critical, I think, to um, what we, accomplished, but we hadn't yet seen our greatest challenge. Our greatest challenge wasn't the volume of our data. Our greatest challenge wasn't team chemistry or adopting agile, although all those things were challenges of themselves. Those weren't our greatest challenges. Our greatest challenge was that a competitor, a government that had no regard for IP, started a company to compete with us and they wrote on the head headlines of their newspapers if micron won't sell us their technology then we'll steal it from them and then they sent people out to do it they sent people to boise idaho to sit in in, in um, hotels and call engineers and try to get them to sell secrets they have no regard for ip and our CISO walked into our office one day and said, shut down your data warehouse. You've got too much data in one place. It's too easy for people to steal it. Shut it down now while I stand here. It was literally an edict. We turned off the users to our data warehouse. And so now we had tens of millions invested in hundreds of hours and people were starting to use this solution. And this guy right here, who I actually met in an elevator when we bought his company. He was the general manager of our Taiwan plant. And he, he, the general manager, was walking out with our secrets and selling them across the street to the Chinese. And he went to jail for it. But um, this is the problem that we were up against. So we had a new challenge. We needed to innovate. We had to go look for solutions. We had, our criteria was simple. Make it fast. It has to be fast. It has to perform fast. When you've got tens of billions of records and tens of trillions of records, tens of billions joined to tens of trillions, it can't slow that down. So all the competitive solutions out there that said, we'll install a layer over your data and you send your queries through us and we'll secure your data out the window. None of them will work. None of them will work at this scale. I argue if they work at any scale, but fact is we needed something that was fast, easy, and wasn't new technology. We had already invested our technology budget we needed something that worked on the technology we already had. So we built it. We came up with it. And I actually met this guy at a conference. Uh, this isn't Albert Einstein, but he was a, a lookalike. And so I had to get my picture with him because Einstein said, make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. So we took a step back at security. And instead of being intimidated by it, we said, how can we make this work on our existing technology? And we came up with a solution. We had already, we had a little bit of a head start because our manufacturing systems people had been thinking about this already and they had a they had a schema out there that had our security policies in metadata so we latched onto that think about that we had our security policies in metadata not in documents on lawyers desks or in security you know in the minds of security admins we actually had a metadata repository for our security policies it's not as hard as you think we perfected it we made it work and then we realized this will work on any relational database in any modeling paradigm. So let's apply it on our Teradata instance, on our data vault and see how it works. And then eventually extend it into the Hadoop environment and any of our SQL servers. And heck, it even works on our source systems. So it was pretty revolutionary. As far as our data warehouse goes, the premise was security is a business rule. 
security is who can see which data. It might be a masking rule, it might be a filtering rule, it might be an obfuscation rule, but the fact is it's a business rule. And the data vault architecture gave us a place to put business rules. So naturally, that's where we look and we built our security into the business vault such that all the objects downstream in the presentation layer and in the visualization layer automatically were secured by the same set of policies. And it was revolutionary. And our CISO said, okay, you can turn your 50,000 users back on again. And they all saw only what they needed to see to do their jobs, but not what they didn't need to see. The CEO could see um, financial data, but he didn't need to see PII, so why would we show him PII? The HR person needed to see PII, but they didn't need to see financial data, nor did they need to see product data. In fact, product engineers needed to see data that relied specifically to their part that they were working on in the step in the process that they were working, but they didn't need to see the rest of the steps and they didn't need to see any of the other product. So now they couldn't walk out with all the, with all, it took collaboration to steal our IP at that point. So that's what revolution it, revolutionized it at Micron was, now people had to collaborate because no one person or two people could get at all of our secret recipe data, okay? So we put that, those rules as business rules in the business vault and everything downstairs benefited. When I left Micron, my first client was with the healthcare industry and I found out, wow, okay, we're going in the wrong direction. Um, despite the best efforts of governments to manage data security, it ain't working. And this is 2019 data. Uh, but as you can see, the number of breaches of PII and PHI are going up every day, regardless of our HIPAA policies in the United States or the GDPR or California protection. They're, they're all going in the wrong direction. And we believe that security was a solution for that because it was consistent, it was easy. It didn't require an army to manage these policies. They were managed in metadata. Once you understood it, it was fairly straightforward. So we put a, a solution together, we called it InfoSecure. And the point is that in our innovation, we turned something complex into something simple. And that's really, really hard to do. I actually looked up quotes that say that, and there's like a hundred quotes out there of famous people and smart people saying exactly that. It's really hard to make something complex simple. And when you can do it, you've actually really discovered something. So security in the data warehouse at the cell level with policies that were managed by a team of three for 50,000 users and trillions of rows of data. And it was simple. So now we do that for our other clients. And it's the last piece of the puzzle because our cloud data warehouse can only do some of these things. Data Vault can only do some and automation can do some real well, but the security piece, nobody was tackling that. And we felt like that was the last piece to our puzzle and it was probably arguably the most important piece. And we should have started with it instead of reacting later. It would have saved our users a week or two while we scrambled to find an approach that might work uh, would have saved them some some time some downtime there when we had that that leak breach scare. I'll pause on this slide. Any comments or thoughts? There's one question on the chat. Okay. Kalal asks uh, to use uh, data warehouse augmentation or offloading. Um. I guess I, I need to define what that is. If you're talking about federalization and having some of your data stored, say in you know unstructured or semi-structured off in the Hadoop environment, then yes, that's what we did. If you mean something different than that, please clarify. We did have drill yeah. across going on between our structured relational data and our semi-structured um, um, you know, file-based Hadoop data. Yeah, data warehouse offloading means essentially having uh, the most recent data in your relational data warehouse and offloading the uh, more old data to uh, yeah. Hadoop okay. cluster. Yeah, so and data warehouse augmentation means having your model, uh, uh, your, your model um, 
divided between uh, the Hadoop and uh, the, uh, the traditional model? Yeah, to some extent we did that. I mean, there was some data that was just too big to put in any relational system. And, and it wasn't even practical to do it. So to that extent, those are the leaf nodes of your satellites if you're data vault literate, right? Some of the satellites were so large, that's the tens of trillions of records, right? So we did have a, uh, a federation drill, drill through capability that allowed uh, for us to move. It wasn't so much our historical data, although we may have done that in some cases, moved historical data out into that environment. It certainly would have worked for that. But I think for, my, for us, it was just sheer volume of some of those data sets that caused us to go that direction. Um, and as far as our model goes, yeah, some of those items, some of those objects, some of the satellites were were out on a different platform. Yeah. Good question. Keep them coming. The rest of the slides aren't technical. They're just about what, uh, and there's only three left, so I think we're on target here. Um, they're just about kind of how, uh, you know, the, the motherhood and apple pie um, team type relationships that we had we had a diverse team and and you know i i'm not saying that we often uh, without being political diversity has nothing to do with who is on the team it has to do with the ideas you're sharing on the team in my opinion now that does have to do with who's on the team because you get different ideas by having different perspectives and people from different life you know events have different perspectives so we had that and we had people from all over the world uh, we were a global company but Really, it was in the power of being able to challenge each other and say, let's debate that. Um, and let's figure out if that really is the best way. You know, does security really have to be hard? Or can we put our heads together and come up with a, a solution that maybe can change the, at least our world and maybe for some other people, right? So I think it was those diverse discussions where people weren't afraid to try something different and even fail. That was the diversity that really allowed us to uh, put the right pieces together to build this. And oftentimes the answer was not my idea or your idea, but some hybrid of the two, right? Another thing we did, I alluded to this earlier, where we split the team and said, both of you solve the same problem as fast as possible and the winner wins, right? The winner gets dinner and a movie. It's amazing how a couple hundred bucks can motivate a team when you add a little bit of competition. But um, there were other ways to split our teams and, and help us specialize. Uh, we had a team that did nothing but acquire data from source systems and landing, land, land them on our warehouse environment. And they did that really well. And in order to land trillions of records every day, you had to get really good at that. And so they specialized and they did that. And we didn't, us, the modeling team, didn't really have to worry about that. We, we had to worry about the integration. And somebody worried about the governance and somebody else worried about the presentation. So that's just one way that you can split the teams, but allowing people to focus, if you have the luxury of having a team large enough to specialize, this can be very valuable. If you don't, then challenge yourself to focus on a specific problem and solve it and then see how that solution fits into the big picture. And then iterate through that until you have all the little problems solved and then automate the result. I'm doing that right now for a client. They're, they're having us do something with their data warehouse we've never done before. And we're having to solve small problems and then put them into a big picture. Um, you can also break up your team by business unit, right? This especially makes sense in the presentation layer. If you've broken your data down into a data vault, you can build it back up into virtual marts that make sense for your users. And being able to specialize, that's just another example of where specialization was successful. And finally, um, you know, trusting each other. This is, again, seems pretty obvious, but we had a special team there. Uh, we had people, like I said, from all over the world and all different walks of life, but we collaborated really well and we got to where we trusted each other, respected each other. We had ideas, we had debates. We had junior members and senior members. We had Asia, Asian members and North American members. We had, you know, um, uh, fresh college graduates and seasoned veterans. So um, together we made the world better, I believe. And uh, I'm just privileged to have been a part of that team. And I left the team at that point, really almost at our 
pinnacle. And I thought, you know, what if we could take the ideas that we implemented there and help share them with other companies that are changing the world, but with different problems, smaller sets of data, but it's dirty or healthcare data, where maybe there's only 10 rows of data for that particular rare disease, but those 10 rows are extremely complex because they contain the human genome. And what if we could apply what we did here at Micron and we made it valuable for others. And so that's what we offer. We take these principles, we apply them at other companies. We try to help people make sense of their healthcare data and secure it and share it widely while protecting it fiercely with InfoSecure. And we try to help um, school systems that can't afford a data architect we try to help them get their feet underneath themselves for a platform that helps them to cope with the chaos that is COVID in the school systems. And so we believe that we're changing the world one small organization at a time through these practices that I've shared with you today. And we would love to have dialogue with you about that. So please reach out to me um, in any, any one of these mediums and I'd be happy to uh, start a conversation. Um, my boss told me once that company across the valley from us, they're not competing with us. They're actually not, not much like us, but it won't be long before they're solving the same solving problems we haven't solved yet. And so we reached out and started helping them and pretty soon it was true. And so that dialogue and that collaboration with others in the industry, I think is extremely important. So I'm passionate about data modeling. I'm passionate about pattern driven automation approaches. Um, if you've had solutions, if you've had experiences with other technologies that I haven't mentioned here that you've had positive or negative experience with, please let me know because we're always looking for a better way to solve problems. So there's my address information. Thanks for listening today.